All right, everybody. Good gracious, this thing is loud. Whew. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> All right. Okay. You can sit down now. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. Hope you had a good day. If you're planning on doing yard work tomorrow, find something else to do. It's supposed to rain. Imagine that. It's good to see y'all. Glad you're here. Everybody had a good Easter? Survived that? Do they, they make a mess? It happens. Yeah. Yeah, Cindy said she had to clean her house. She had messy folks at her house too. We had a good one. Yeah, we had a we had a good one. We went and saw our grandson baptized over at Rinkin uh, on Sunday. Baptized in a hot tub. <laughs> they had a trough like ours. It went to leaking, so they had to change, and they found they could buy a hot tub cheaper than they could buy a trough. <laughs> so they bought the hot tub. I told the pastor, I stole this from Keith. I told the pastor we need to turn the jets on to make it look like the spirit's moving the water. <laughs> that Keith is clever. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, no real announcements to share with you um, other than what you see on the back of the uh, uh, prayer list. And I won't insult your intelligence by reading that to you. Uh, just pay attention to that. There are some changes in normal things, uh, so just just look at that and make note of it. And so now we'll go to the front side of the uh, prayer sheet, and we've got some things to share with you there. And hopefully you'll have some updates or things you can share with us. And then we'll have a time of prayer, and then we'll get back. Uh, I think we're going to be in Exodus tonight. I can't. He swear to that, but I think that's where we're going. Uh, okay. Um, looking at the church family part of our prayer list, you see the name of Pebbles uh, Pittman there. Uh, she's got some tests uh, and procedures coming up, so remember her. And then, of course, you see the other names there. Uh, Miss Carol Fordham, uh, her family has invited hospice to come and uh, help with her care, and uh, I believe David is even involved in that with his, his company, and they're trying to make life uh, a little bit better for her right now. So continue to pray for Miss Carol and Mr. Buddy. Uh, you see Butch's name on there. Butch has had some, some issues, as many of you already know, but the good news is Butch has been in the kitchen this evening, so he must be doing some better. Uh, but continue to pray for Butch. Butch needs the prayers, and we need to practice. Uh, in the middle column, the only one I would share with you, the comments I would make on that one, is Jane Tripp. Jane went back to the doctor. The bone had moved just a little bit, but he said he didn't think that was a, a problem, and they're not going to have to do surgery as of yet. She will be going back to the doctor later, and they'll make another determination, so uh, continue to pray for Jane. She did say in the text she sent me, she said she had two excellent caregivers in uh, Ernie and uh, Jennifer, uh, taking really good care of her, so uh, thankful for that. Any updates on any of people that we have on our prayer list, or do you have additions that we need to make? <coughs> Okay. Yeah, for some of you may not have heard this, Michelle Cranford was running over at the college 
Was that Monday? And uh, a lady did not see her and hit her. And she rolled up on the hood of the car up to the windshield. And then the lady slammed on brakes. And then she slid off the hood in, in front there. But uh, she's uh, no bones are broken, just kind of scraped up and kind of banged up a little bit. But yeah. thankful for that. I did send her a text of sympathy. I told her that running, I've been telling them for years, running is not good for you. <laughs> <clears throat> One more reason why I don't run. <laughs> Among many reasons of why I don't. All right, any other? Okay, we'll move to our extended family. And you see the names of those that are listed there. Uh, would highlight for you the family of Mr. Frank Jones. This is Andrea Williams, Andrea and Andy uh, Williams. This is her father, uh, 90, I believe he's 92 years old, and uh, lived down in Eastman, a uh, very fine man. And uh, his service is tomorrow at Hardy Towns at 2, I think it is. So do pray for Andrea and her family. And then you see the other names uh, listed there for us, uh, those that uh, need to be remembered. And I don't have any I need to highlight or wanted to highlight necessarily. Um, Jenny Floyd, many of you know Jenny, she will be having surgery, if I remember correctly, it's in Savannah. Uh, anybody know for that? Okay. Well, just pray for Jenny. And, of course, you see the other names listed there as well. Continue to pray for them. And, Bobby, yes. Bobby Bowman will be moving to Bryant Nursing Home tomorrow. Okay. Bobby Bowman is going to Bryant Nursing Home. Okay. Oh, Bryant Nursing Home. Okay. Also, my daughter Hale's niece, she passed away. And which one is that? Oh, okay, okay, Terry, Terry Helms, gotcha, okay, sorry to hear that. Now, there was one I was going to mention there, and if I can remember who it was, oh, yeah, uh, Carolyn Kitchen's sister, uh, she, she went back home, if I'm not mistaken, does anyone, has anyone talked to Carolyn? Okay. All righty. Any, any other updates on any of these? My dad came home today. He, so he is no longer in rehab? He is no longer in rehab. Okay. That's good news. <laughs> okay. All right. Go to the back side of the sheet, if you will. And uh, there on you will find the names of those in our various care facilities and uh, continue to pray for them. Uh, anyone have any kind of an update on any of these that uh, you'd like to share with us? I saw my brother Bob today uh, just before lunch. He was real alert. Uh, he still, he ate one piece of bacon for breakfast. Uh, not eating much. Uh, off a lot, took him off a lot of the medication, but uh, he's hanging in there. Uh, he's only 96, so I guess he's yeah. Some of you probably saw, saw or may have seen this. I think it was last week we saw a picture of him on Facebook looking at his potatoes that he planted. He was looking out in one day and they were still, the freeze got him a little bit, but they're coming back out and he's still yeah. happy about that. Yeah. How about that? 96. All right. Any other updates? Okay. <coughs> yes. Yes, Regional Bible Drills Tuesday here. Three high schoolers from here. Okay. Pray for those students that will be coming. I'm not sure how many are coming. Good. Hey, seven high schools. Great. All righty. Any others?
already. Under special prayer needs, you see the items there, uh, as well as our missionaries. Continue to pray for them. Anything else we need to add to our prayer list? Okay. I guess it is at this point that we pray then. Sammy Hawk, how about leading us in our prayer, please? Father, we come to you with these uh, prayer requests and uh, three, Father, families that we know right now, especially for the Rogers family. Uh, the faithful man of God who was in here, Ben and Glenda both, Father. We're so thankful for the opportunity we have of fellowship and in serving with them. And we pray for Jackie and for Benji and the family, Father, and for others that have lost loved ones, Father, we pray that you cover it this time. You just wrap your arms around them and draw them close to you as only you can do. And Father, we are thankful for the resurrection Savior that we celebrate Sunday. We don't serve a, a dead God. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful we serve a living Savior. And uh, Father, I just pray now that you just go with us tonight as this Bible study. I pray for every family that's here and family that represents Father that you would work in our lives, Father, uh, and draw us all close to you. And uh, I pray that you forgive us of our sins. We ask in Jesus' precious name. We're going to cover seven chapters tonight. No, they're not. You know, if you look on the sides of your chair, uh, some of them are equipped with seat belts. And if yours is one of those, you may want to just put it on right now. Okay, um, we really are. I'm going to try. We'll see what happens. I do have to <clears throat> look back for just a moment. If you remember two weeks ago when we were in Exodus, we weren't in it last, last week. We had communion. <clears throat> we looked at that whole thing about how back in, in chapter 24, after Moses' first conversation with God, he came down and he actually wrote that stuff down himself. I'd never noticed that before, and I shared that with you. It wasn't until at the end of these seven chapters we're going to do here in just a minute that we get to the tablets. And all those things that Moses wrote down uh, seem to have been gathered into what was called the Book of the Covenant. And that was what Moses read from when he was speaking to the people in chapter 24. And the thing about that whole first set of instructions, if you remember, because we looked at those chapters, 21, 22, and 23, those were regulations, guidelines, statutes, directions, for people getting along with people. You remember that? You know, how to resolve conflict and when, you know, when my, my donkey kills your chihuahua, you know, who, who's got to pay what and what's the recompense and, you know, what, uh, <clears throat> how things are to be adjudicated in our human relationships with each other. And I was kind of reflecting on that some in the two weeks since. <clears throat> Obviously, we are in covenant with God. Those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have entered into a covenant with God. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, is, uh, is the history of God's covenant, his first covenant or contract or deal or relationship with his people, the Hebrew people. And then Jesus came along, and it's through his blood that the new covenant has been sealed. And so now the gospel of Jesus Christ is open to all, Jew and Gentile. And so we are in covenant with God, and we understand that. And that's generally the way we think of covenant. But you know, it dawns on me uh, that the body of Christ is called to be in covenant with each other as well. We, we are called 
to live life a, a specific way. If you look back in, in Exodus 21, 22, 23, and then there in 24 when he pulls out that book of covenant, that was a book of covenant that was mostly related to how we're supposed to get along or how the people of God are supposed to get along. And then if you come over to the New Testament, there's just a lot of teaching about this is what ought to be going on within the body of Christ. Jesus himself said, okay, here's one of the ways the world's going to know that you belong to me. How's that? In that you have love one for the other. You, you love differently. You serve differently within the body of Christ. You forgive. You turn the other cheek. You, you, you go the extra mile. You, 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 you give sacrificially to one another. You, you love extravagantly. You demonstrate in your relationships the covenant you have with each other the reality of the covenant that I have with you through Jesus Christ. So it's just kind of an interesting thing, and it's a good reminder to us that we have been called into one body. We are the body of Christ. In the New Testament, the book of Corinthians, it, you know, we're reminded, look, there are many parts, but still just one body. We're one body. The head of the body is Christ, and we all are members. And, um, and, and because of that, we relate to each other in a, in a particular and a peculiar way when it comes to the world standards. So... Those three chapters of guidelines uh, that we've already studied, those really were about human-to-human -human relationship. Now God, beginning in chapter 25, is giving detailed instructions, and these are related to worship. These are related to the place of worship and the things of worship and the symbols of worship, and, 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 and God was laying it out. And these are the things we're going to see at the end if, in seven chapters from now. And you're sitting there going, I don't believe that. Just watch this. It's going to be a miracle. You know, he writes those on a tablet, gives them to Moses. And, of course, Moses, after presenting those, what was he supposed to do with those tablets? Where was he supposed to put them? In the church library? In the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? But those two never made it to the Ark of the Covenant, Right? Because what did Moses do with that first set? Yeah, I got kind of aggravated and threw them down and broke them. But we're not, we're not going to talk about that tonight. That's coming up next week. So are you with me, Exodus 25? You ready for this? Got seatbelt on. We're not going to read all those verses, by the way. If you're sitting there going, what? No. Exodus 25, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, so now this is Moses, again, up on the mountain. The people are down at the bottom of the mountain. They're waiting. It turns out to be a 40-day wait. That turns out to be a bad thing for them. We'll get to that. So in all that time, they're waiting, and then the trouble they get into, this is the conversation that God is having with Moses. Verse 2, speak to the people of Israel that they, that they take for me a contribution. Oh, offerings. How about that? From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. And that's interesting. In the New Testament, when God's teaching us about giving, what does he say? God loves what kind of giver? Yeah. You know, we give out of adoration. We give out of love. We give out of a desire to be a part of what God's doing. So from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. But look at this. God gets real specific. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze. Okay, now this is where y'all need to be writing down notes. Okay, related to the upcoming offerings uh, that we practice. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram's skins, goat skins. Okay, and we're going to give all that stuff to the thread bearers. Okay, so you need to bring that stuff in. They're going to take it and use it and make some nice stuff. Acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Okay, so here we're being introduced. The tabernacle is fixed to be introduced. That, that which represented the presence of God among the people as they journeyed. It was collapsible be packed up, moved wherever they are, set back up, place of worship, the holy area, and then the holy of holies and all the things that go with it. <clears throat> verse 9, um, the, uh, verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst exactly as I show you. 
concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. Okay, so let me make some really quick points right here. Now, don't miss this, okay? Number one, God always invites us to participate in what he wants to do. He never invites us to do ourselves what we think God wants done. He always invites us to participate in what he wants to do. Let me ask you, just based off the book of Exodus and what we've seen God do, don't you think it's really fairly reasonable that God could have provided all of these things that he just asked the people to bring by way of offering? I mean, is it like God's going kind of bankrupt right here, and he's like, man, I'm low on linen and blue cloth? And, and I, I mean, think manna from heaven, okay? I mean, really. He could have just said, okay, boom. You see that pile of stuff right there? That's what you're going to use to build this tabernacle, and I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. He didn't do that. He asked the people to join into this, to bring, as their hearts moved them, offerings of these things because these were the things that they were going to use to make this tabernacle. God always invites us to participate with him in what he's doing. Yeah, he could have provided all this, but, you know, God's also a planner, and God also plans ahead, okay? So we're talking about a wandering people right now that are out there in the wilderness, and he's asking for this really specific offering. So let's back up just a little bit more. When the people of Israel were getting ready to exit their oppressors in Egypt, the Bible tells us that God instructed the people to ask the Egyptians for what? All this stuff right here. And they loaded them down because by that time, the Egyptians were like, well, yeah, go, go. What, you take it. Here, here's the key to the front door. Whatever you want, you get it and go. So this wandering nomadic people right now, they're out here, but they, they got some stuff. And God's, God's given them a chance to bring that as an offering willingly because they're moved in their heart to do that, whereby they're sharing in what it is that God is building, what God is going to do, uh, which I think is pretty neat. The offerings were gathered, but they're to be used. And this is one of the challenges for the church even today. Offerings that are gathered <clears throat> are to be used not for our purposes, but for who? For those things that fulfill the purposes of God, the goals of God, the priorities of God. That's one of the things <clears throat> in our church budget and the way we handle our money here is that we really try to prioritize some things that we know are consistent with our Great Commission calling, uh, whether it's our giving to the cooperative program, whether it's our investment in the many different local ministries that we invest in. I want to tell you, when I share with pastor friends of mine, we, we, you know, sometimes pastors get talking, and, um, and, and, and we love to compare. Isn't that, isn't that right? Yeah, we love to compare. And they'll start that with me. I'll say, dude, don't even, you don't even want to. I said, I pastor the best church in the state of Georgia, and you really want to go up against that? And, and, and I can't tell you how many times I said, okay, we give 15% of the cooperative program. What about y'all? I said, 20. Go ahead. What's your next shot? That, that's it. We, 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 almost, we, almost, we almost met Lottie Moon and Andy Armstrong goals last year. We, we surpassed both ours. Go ahead. What, what else you got? Well, that's kind of it. I said, okay, let me tell you. And then I start talking about things like um, <clears throat> Promise of Hope and um, Sacred Roots Farm and FCA and, and Buffy Buff and the things that we, that we give to out of our budget right here. And when you put all that together, and you know this, I'm just reminding you of something. Every dollar that comes in by way of an offering into this church, 33 cents of it goes right back out. We give 30, we tie 33% of the offerings that are brought to this church to support what's going on in our bigger world. There are things that we're involved in as a church, and you don't even know it, that we could never be involved in by ourselves. But because we support the cooperative program and the Georgia Baptist Convention and, and, and the Pulaski Bleckley Association, we are touching lives that, that you'll never know about. Because God multiplies that kind of giving, and he uses it in a powerful way. He invites us to share 
and to go about things that he is doing. Henry Blackaby, who's ever heard of the name Henry Blackaby? Some of you have. Who's ever been through the Experience in God study? That's where most people learn about Henry. One of the things Henry Blackaby loved to say in that all the time, he said, it's not for Christians to stand here and have prayer meetings to decide what to do for God. The thing that Christians do is we, we get our head up and we look around to find where God is working. And then we just move ourselves over here. And we join in with that. So when, when God is calling for his people to give an offering, he's saying, I'm inviting you to join me in what I'm doing over here. We're going we're gonna to build a tabernacle. Now, here's the key. I'm going to tell you how to do it. And I'm going to give you the privilege of doing the work. Okay? So here we go. Now, this is where we get to going really fast. Because if you're sitting there going, oh, my gosh, we're not even going to get to chapter 25 at this rate. Yes, we are. We are now going to go through... Uh, <clears throat> Basically, from verse 10 of chapter 25 all the way down through uh, chapter 31. We're not going to read those scriptures, but we're going to, I'm going to talk about or point out all the different instructions and things that God addresses throughout these chapters. And on a couple of them, I'm going to stop and, and talk about it a little bit and, and just point out some things. But I would encourage you, and, and the reason I'm doing it this way and, and look at me. Y'all know I have, I, I can take one verse of Scripture and spend an hour on it. I, I really can. And to me, that's great, great fun. And, and for, for y'all, it's a great nap. I mean, it's a win-win situation. But to go through these five chapters and, and to look at the symbology involved and all the different little things, it, it would, it, we'd, probably, it, we'd probably spend three weeks on each one of these chapters just to go through. So what I would encourage you to do in your personal quiet time is to, to go back, get your commentary, sit down there with uh, chapter 25 and go down through verse 31 and just kind of really look at some of these things. But this is how we're going to do it. What, what kind of detailed instructions did God give for this tabernacle? Okay? So in the remainder of chapter 25, we just read the first nine verses. In the remainder of that chapter... He gives very specific instructions about building the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And this Ark of the Covenant was, a, was the, the, the physical symbol of the presence of God, his, his presence resting uh, above the cherubim that sat on the hood or, or the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Very specific, the kind of wood and what it was supposed to be overlaid with and all these kind of things. Uh, also, in uh, the rest of chapter 25 are instructions about building the table of the bread of the presence. And this was a table that went right there in front of, in front of the Holy of Holies. And there was bread on that table all the time, okay? Twelve loaves representing the twelve tribes of Israel. And, and this whole bread of presence is a foreshadowing of something that's coming in the New Testament. They had to replace this bread every day. The priest would eat it. But then in the New Testament, who comes? The bread of, the bread of life. The bread of life. It's a foreshadowing of Christ and, 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 and his presence with us. Um, so you, you had the building of that table and also the lampstand. They would stand right outside also that curtain leading into the Holy of Holies. And if you want to at some point go really study this, but this lampstand was, God instructed, it was to be made out of one solid piece of gold. One chunk of gold weighing 75 pounds. Okay, and, and, and of course, it was detailed about how high it was supposed to be, and then it came up, and then it branched up where the, where the oil wicks would be, and, and, and this lamp, this solid gold hammered-out lamp stand stood there, and um, it, was, it, was, it was lit from, um, from evening till morning constantly. And it's another foreshadowing of what? Jesus who said, all those who believe in me will walk in the light. They shall no longer walk in darkness. The presence of the light always with us. Then you get to chapter 26. In chapter 26, the entire chapter is about all the specifics and the measurements and the, and the way to, to, to construct the tabernacle, this mobile worship center, okay, which basically was a uh, the, the Holy of Holies, the inner room, which would house the Ark of the Covenant, and then the, the veil between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place where the table of the presence, the bread of the presence and the lampstand were, and then the courtyard 
where people would come in. And there's so many things about this that are so interesting, this whole tabernacle. That's why I'd encourage you, if you've never really studied it, to go look at it. Um, you know, look up diagrams of it. There's things like uh, the, the, the outer walls that are constructed. And these are mobile. You know, they had to cut the poles and it could be assembled but taken down. But they were of such a height that people could not look into what was going on on the inside. It was, not pos- it was not possible to be a spectator in worship. I was studying that, and I thought, you know what? That's a beautiful thought right there. Because worship is a personal thing. It's not a spectator thing. To worship, you need to be in the presence of God instead of standing back looking. I don't know if anybody's ever watched any of the baseball games at Wrigley Field. Has anybody ever watched or been to Wrigley Field? Anybody? Have you been there? Is it right field or left field where there's some apartments or something with uh, little outdoor areas that are not a part of the stadium, but people come out and put their lawn chairs there, and uh, and they'll watch the game, you know, looking down on the stadium. They're not really in the game, and and they, and they don't sense the you know the power of the crowd, and you know they get this binoculars all the time and all that kind of stuff. But they're really not in there, and and they can't get some of that good stadium food from up there, you know. And, and, and so, you know, those walls. Here's another thing about the, the outer walls of this whole tabernacle area that, that, that surrounded the, the courtyard leading into where the, where the sacrifices were made and then where Aaron went into the holy of holy places is that there was only one entrance into it. There's only one wall where the curtain was in two pieces where people could enter, only one way in. Jesus said in John, when it's talking about coming to the Father, he says, what? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You can't come to the Father except through me. I'm the door of the sheep. I'm the door of the sheep. I mean, just there's so many cool things here that God was just kind of putting into daily practice for his people because they had a lot to learn. This is a new relationship between them and God. This is a new thing. He's really having to help them learn about what worship is about what holiness is versus you know uh, our our sinfulness and 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 how we have to recognize that. So all this stuff about the building of the tabernacle, chapter twenty-seven. Look at that. We are rocking here, aren't we? Look at that. It's only seven o two. We're already on the third chapter. The third chapter, uh, or in chapter twenty-seven, <clears throat> um, there's several, uh, oh, not a lot, but there, there, there's several different things. One are the specific instructions for the altar of burnt offering. And these burnt offerings were offered on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, the people brought them in. And um, so there was a very specific building of that altar and, and its dimensions and, and what it was to be covered with. Um, and then you had the courtyard of the tabernacle, which I was just describing some of that just now. And then he, he asked that the people bring clear olive oil for the lampstand, which stood outside of the Holy of Holy Curtains, and I mentioned that already. So that is a very specific instruction from God. This lamp will burn every night until morning, and I want the people to be a part of keeping that going by bringing their oil, by, by, by recognizing that, that, that this has to do with their relationship with me. So that's in verse 20, or chapter 27. Chapter 28. Now, <clears throat> um, I almost started to really dig deep here in chapter 28 because this entire chapter is about the priestly garments. And there is some symbolism there. It's kind of neat. It's also some stuff that you're like, wow, you know. Um, you had the ephod and you had the breast piece. You had the robe of the ephod. There was a, a gold seal attached to a turban that the priest would wear. There was a tunic. There was a sash and caps. And here's an interesting one. There were also linen undergarments, special made for the priests. Not really to stay cool. According to Scripture, if you're going to read it, it was to make sure that their nakedness was never exposed in the presence of God because it was so contrary to His holiness. I mean, all of this is just about God establishing his glory of helping his people to understand that he is not like all of the pagan gods that they've been surrounded by there in Egypt. He he is far above and beyond them all because he is only true God. And even among those who would minister on behalf of the people in the presence of God, the priest, he, he, he wanted to make sure the people understood their standing, the standing of the priesthood, 
and what was going on there and that, that Aaron was the mouthpiece of the people to God and then God to the people. And, and so it was so important that Aaron be able to come into the presence of God and then come out of the presence of God because there are many examples in the Old Testament of people who went wrongly into the presence of God or who reached out to touch the presence of God and because it was done the wrong manner, what happened, Glenn? Yeah, that was it. Everybody remembers the story of the, the carrying of the, uh, the ark when they were bringing it back, and it started to wobble a little bit. And what did somebody do? They tried to catch it. I mean, if you see a glass of water wobbling, what are you going to try to do? Oh, look at that. And then, oh, look at that. and then we're gone. Why? Because that wasn't their place. It wasn't their place. Part, part of a... Part of the priestly garments here um, were, were, were jingle bells. How many of you have studied that a little bit? The bells that were sewn into the bottom of the priest's robe. And the purpose of those bells was so that he could be heard and so that the people would know he was still alive. If, if they heard the bells jingling around, they knew, okay, he's good. <laughs> he's good. He, he, he washed his hands. He got everything right. He's got his linen undergarments on. Everything's going good. And, and it became a thing to where when the priest would go in to the holy place in the Holy of Holies, they would tie a rope around his ankle. Why? Yeah, if you went in there in ignorance of what God had commanded, he would die. And then one day, may, I'm not going to, I'm not going to volunteer to go in there and get him. And so, that, can you imagine? Oh, my gosh, Aaron, what did you do? You know, and pulling him out. I mean, it's just, you, you and I are, we're in the church age. We're in the age of grace. We, we are saved by the grace of God. We, we, no longer, we no longer have to have a representative to bring us into the presence of God. We now can enter boldly through the way, the living way, which is Christ Jesus. We, we, we have, we have had the scriptures. All of us in this room have had the scriptures, Old and New Testament, and as long as we can remember. And we've studied about the holiness of God, and we've read about the glory of God in Isaiah. And we, we've studied about the, the awesome wrath of God against the sin of all humanity. But we've also studied about the great uh, 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 restraint that God shows in dealing with his creation. I mean, we, we, we have a sense of that. But I want to say that sometimes I think we, we, if we're not, sometimes we get really crossed, cl close to kind of crossing that line from, from our creator created perfection, imperfection, saved by grace based on God's choosing, not by anything we've ever done, earned, could we pay back? We can never forget that. We, if we ever begin to think that we're kind of equal partners with, with God and what he's got going on, we, we've really taken a misstep there, okay? Because it's, it's never that way. Yes, he calls us his friend. But, you know, my, my dad, of course, he's been with Jesus now for over 20 years. But even after I got into my adult years, in, in our in our in our relationship evolved uh, from the father son dynamic of, of my younger years into a different father son dynamic. Now that I was an adult and I was raising children, our conversations were different. We had much deeper conversations about much more serious things. You know, for a lot of those younger years, it was it was about him pouring into me and me listening a lot. And now as we get older, it's there was a lot of questioning and answering and back and forth and me going to him for wisdom and him challenging me and getting back. But I never, ever, 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 ever forgot that was my daddy. And I owed him the respect that a son owes his father. I, 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 never, I never chummed up to my dad in the way I did with guys like I played sports with or like I did in the locker room. They're just, you just don't talk to your daddy that way sometimes, anytime. Because of that relationship, always remembering what it is. 
And so it is with God. He wants us to understand. He loves us dearly. He's called unto himself, but at great cost. And we need always remember as we walk in his shadow, as we learn to, in, in, to experience the intimacy of the relationship, that we never become the co-creator. We are always the son or the daughter. He is the father. He is the creator. He, we can never forget that. And we kind of see that in, in how he's kind of setting all this up on, on an outward basis here for the people to begin to learn from here because they're so young in their relationship with God and understanding exactly what it means. Chapter 29, moving on. It's 710. Oh, we're going to do this easy. Um, th there's two things that are dealt with in chapter 29. The, the biggest majority of that chapter is, is uh, the whole consecration of the priest, this whole uh, process that they went through uh, to consecrate a priest so that he might then serve in the tabernacle. He might serve in the holy area uh, without fear of losing his life. And it's just, it, it's, it's, it's very ceremonial. Uh, it's beautiful. It, 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 it's, it's, it, it, in it, you see the need for us to be washed, cleansed, before we come into the presence of God. You see the washing that they do from the basin that they have built as a part of God's instructions here. Um, and then the consecration of the tabernacle itself so that it is a place where God's presence can rest. So uh, that's a neat thing. We kind of practice this stuff nowadays. Who's ever been to somewhere where they're building a new church? And at some point in the church, usually before it's dried in, it's, it's framed up, studded up, but before it's dried in, of course, it's, if it's a concrete slab or whatever kind of floor it's got, uh, a lot of times, and people do this with their homes too. They'll have what? What will they do? I heard somebody say, "Right, yeah." They'll invite. Uh, they'll invite others to come in. They'll invite the church members to come in. If it's somebody that's building a house, they'll invite people, uh, you know, friends, neighbors, people from the church to come, and they'll just kind of have a, a prayer walk in and around and through the property. And they'll have these sharpie pens, and people just go through and they'll write scripture on those on those studs and, and put what it is, and they'll write stuff on the floor, and and it's just really kind of a neat thing. And so then when the flooring is put down, the sheet rot, and the and the, the the siding on the outside and the roof. You know, there's just this kind of thing as you're walking through there, just thinking, you know, there are verses all over the studs of this building, and it's been prayed for, and it's just really kind of a neat thing. And that's kind of what the whole idea of consecrating the, the tabernacle is, to, 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 to set it apart for a very specific purpose. Chapter 30. Okay, <clears throat> you have your altar of incense, which is, which is a big part, the aroma. Um, and, of course, in the New Testament where... We're told to be an aroma pleasing to God. You know, our lives now are that incense, um, so to speak. So there's the altar of incense and its, its construction. Then there's a section about uh, with instructions about the ransom money or the atonement money. Now, we're going to come back to that one in just a minute, okay? Because that's really kind of a very interesting uh, about seven verses that we're going to finish up with. There's that basin I mentioned a minute ago that's uh, for washing that will be used by Aaron and by the priest. And then this is interesting. If you go right there in the last two sections of chapter 31st, God gives a recipe. He gives a recipe for the anointing oil that's to be used in the consecration of the priest and different ceremonies. It's a very specific thing in how it's put together and how it's made. And God's very, very particular about this. And he says, this is, a, this, this is my recipe. This is for my purposes. This is for worship. And he goes so far as to saying that he says, this is not for personal use. Anyone who makes this and uses it in their household for personal use will be put out from among their people. You remember what I said about we've got to be careful about not getting too chummy with the things of God and the ways of God, but always accepting him as our creator and, and, and walking in obedience and humility with him. But then right after that, he gives a second recipe, and that's the recipe for the incense that's to burn within the tabernacle. This is a very specific recipe and how it's to be made. 
but there's also restrictions on the use of it. You don't make this at home. You don't burn this incense in your home. This incense, I want it to be something that connects you to worship. I want it to be something that immediately brings you in. Just the aroma brings you into this moment. This is about bringing a sacrifice to God. This is about coming into the presence of God, or this is about somebody coming into the presence of God for you, which would be one of the priests. So it's just kind of interesting that God gives those, and he says, this is not for your personal use. Don't do this. Don't do it. Then we get to chapter 31. We're just, it, all the instructions have been given. And the first thing he does in chapter 31 is he appoints overseers. Two specifically are named right there in the beginning of this chapter. And said, these two guys, I have given them the wisdom, the knowledge, the skills to lead in the building of all this stuff that's got to be built. So he had somebody right there within the church ready, right there within the, the Hebrew nation ready to lead in this effort. And then he kind of goes through and he talks about, you know, uh, people with this talent are going to do this and people with this talent are going to do this and people with talents at, at cutting stones are going to do this because cutting stones was a part of building like the ephod and the tunic and, and the robe and all those kind of things. Then, then he gives some Sabbath instructions. And, and he ties those Sabbath instructions to the creation story. He reminds his people, I, I want you to, to recognize, I want you to, I want you to have a Sabbath every Sabbath day. I don't want you to work that day. I want you to rest. I want you to look around at the beauty of life. I want you to take a deep breath. Uh, ben and I, in our uh, journey through his internship um, this this semester, and I think I mentioned this maybe a couple, three weeks ago, but Ben just finished up one of the books that I had him reading. What was the title of that book? Is it the relentless or the ruthless? R ruthless elimination of hurry. Who's read that book? Is it ruthless or relentless? Huh? <laughs> what is it? Ben, would you look that up on Google real quick? The ruthless. Yeah. Because one time, one time I was telling somebody about it, and I, because uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that book. It really spoke to my heart. I called it the brutal, the brutal elimination of hurry. And I said, okay, no, it's not brutal. It's ruthless. Yeah. So, but, but anyway, the guy writing, and I, I would encourage you to read this, but I really do. Uh, would highly encourage it. Ben, was it a good read? Was it convicting? Yes. Okay. I think honoring the Sabbath in, in the truest sense of the word would help us to get off the hamster wheel. It really would. And um, I'm not going to dive into that deep, but he, he does talk about that. And he actually, he actually, there's some penalties for desecrating the Sabbath, for not honoring the Sabbath that he gives and puts on his people. And um, <clears throat> so at the end of that chapter, um, <clears throat> 31, the tablets are completed and they're given to Moses. Bam, 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 bam. And now we're ready to see what God's people have been doing while Moses has been up there hearing the commands of God. And I can tell you it's not a pretty thing, this very next chapter. So one takeaway, primarily. God is a God of, of infinite variety and creativity. I mean, just look, out, look around this room. No, no two of us are saying those little things on the end of my finger right here. What do we call that? Fingerprint. Who else has that fingerprint right there? Nobody. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Our, our guy down, he's a very detailed God, very specific. There, there's nothing useless in his creation. We might not understand the use of it, but I guarantee you there's purpose in it. Okay. 
And when I, when I just, just in reading through the details that God gives here for the building of this tabernacle, which was, which was to be the place of worship, the, the gathering place, the place where the sacrifices were made, where, where, where Aaron spoke for the people and then Aaron spoke for God to Moses and then back to the people. And he's very specific and very detailed because, one, he was trying to teach his people something. Um, honor, respect, to recognize that worship is an incredibly beautiful time. It's not something you approach haphazardly. It's not something, you know, that just, that, that, that you wait till the last minute to think about. This is something that's very serious when you come into the presence of God, okay? I think that's a part of it. it but it also reminds me that when, when it comes to worship, we're, we're worshiping a God who is not a freelancer, now, I know we like to think sometimes that God's loosey-goosey and freelancy, but he's not. God is a very purposeful, purposeful God. He moves in the directions he moves in. There's always purpose in the ways he moves and the, and, and the why of the ways that he's moving in. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there's two verses. And God's speaking through Paul as Paul is um, working with the Corinthian church and by the way, if there was ever, if there was ever a tough ministry field, it was Corinth. And if there was ever a church that had a lot of stuff going on inside of it that wasn't really, really good, it was it was the church at Corinth. And and Paul, God speaking through Paul, uh, there were some pretty stern instructions about the way you do things, and there's a right way and there's a wrong way when the church gets together. And there's two verses in First Corinthians 14. The first is verse 33, and then the next is verse 40. And these are verses that have to do with what's going on in worship. And in, in, in verse 33, we're told that God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So everything, verse 40, must be done decently and in order. I mean, this is just a part of the nature of God. This, this orderliness, this purpose in all things. Okay? So, so what, what, what does that say to us? Well, it, it says that when we come together to worship, we need to recognize that, that what we bring to that is ourselves, and we need to more and more learn how to, to, to trust the Holy Spirit's leading in those times of worship. We need to understand that when we worship together, uh, I worship God, but if I'm in a if I'm in the congregation, then my worship is also a testimony of my God to those who are around me and in front of me and behind me. And then all of that, there needs to be this sense of the holiness of God and the purpose of God, and that it that it's not about me, it's not about a stage personality, it's not about it's just about the people of God very humbly coming before God, and and, and recognizing the need to be submitted, surrendered to him. In, in the years that I've had the privilege to work with in, in different churches I've worked in and other organizations, I've seen this play out over and over again, and I understand it. I really do because I've, I've, I've done the same thing. You have a church service, okay? And it's one of those kind of church services that you walk away going, heck, oh, wow, that was powerful. You ever been to one of those? You, know, you just walk away and say, man, man, heck, oh, that was something brewing in there. Of course, that's the Holy Spirit of God. There's, I mean, you just, it's like you sense the glory of God just kind of, you know, bearing down on your shoulders a little bit there and, 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 and then so, you know, we, we, we go home and, and, and then Monday we go back to work and, and we're going through the week and then then, and in, in, in like in, 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 in ministerial leadership and as you're planning for the next week's service, if you're not careful, you, you, start, you start trying to plan to do what? To recreate. Now, now, that incredible holy moment that God broke out, now all of a sudden, man, that was incredible. Let's, let's try to make that happen again. And as soon as you think like that, Who's the owner of it? Who's, who's trying to take ownership of it? And we forget that that's not us. 
we, we prepare. Our praise band practices, our choir, they're, they're practicing right now. You know, we study for a sermon, and, 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 and we order out, you know, the different things. We bring that in there. But I know every Sunday my thought is, God, if we don't need to sing a single one of these songs, God, if I don't need to say a single word from this sermon that I prepared, God, however you want to break out in this service, I'm good with that. I really am. If you start leading people down to the altar to pray while I'm making announcements and we spend the rest of that worship time kneeling at the altar and praying, I, I truly am good with that. I really am. That kind of freedom because God is such a God of creativity, but, but when he does that, it's going to be in a way that reflects his character, his peace among us. And it's going to be edifying to everyone. So that's kind of one of my big takeaways. Um, so there you go. Those chapters are great to study. I would encourage you to do that. And so it's 726, and so I'm not even going to get into it, but I'm going to encourage you to do this. If you want to make a note of it or if you think you can remember, that's good. But it, it, when you get a chance, go to Exodus chapter 30, and it's verses 11 through 16, so it's not that many verses. But this is the, the, the ransom offering that God kind of spells out. And it, it kind of, it's really a beautiful foreshadowing of the ransom that was paid for us by Christ on the cross. And because Christ paid that ransom, it never has to be paid again. But here in the context of the Old Testament, uh, this was an offering that, that each male over 20 years old, when, when the census was taken, had to pay as a, as a ransom offering for his life. It was a half shekel. And, of course, that money was, then went in to, 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 to help support all the, the stuff that was needed there in the tabernacle on a regular basis. But how God sets that up, if you really read it and stop and think, wow, what, what, how, how much offering would I have to give if I had to pay my own ransom? So it really wasn't about, it, 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 this was a foreshadowing. It was a reminder because this is something that had to be done over and over again. That you really can't pay the ransom for your life. Only one could do that. and His name is Jesus. And he's paid it in full. And we know that because he came back from the grave. That's what we celebrated last Sunday. For those of you who didn't realize it, last Sunday was Easter. So now we're going to pick it up at chapter 32. Look at that. What time is it, Jed? Let's stand together and pray. Y'all can clap for me if you want to. I think it's pretty good to get through that many chapters. <laughs> we're getting closer and closer to the end of Exodus. And I'm excited because then we're going into Leviticus. All right, so <laughs> everybody's favorite devotional book right there, the book of Leviticus. Yay! Father God, we love you tonight. We thank you for what we learn of you as we study this beautiful, incredible history of your relationship with the Hebrew people. And Father, we are so, so thankful that it was your plan to offer that incredible relationship to all of us, Jew and Gentile through Jesus Christ, your son. We rejoice in that. Father, by your Holy Spirit teaching us, help us to learn when we're looking into Old Testament stuff. Father, forgive us when we kind of discount that because it, it's not really relevant to 2023 because, Father, it, it is relevant. And it, it just deepens and fills in this incredible a relationship we have with you now and we can learn so many things from how you set this stuff up i thank for each person here and the homes they represent the ones watching online bless each one by your grace and it will be by your grace if we are able to be back here sunday father we ask you already to begin preparing our hearts to worship in jesus name amen <clears throat>